Okay, well, I said I'm going to talk about computational language and artifacts from the future. So I'm, I'm going to try and summarize about uh, uh, 40 years worth of work and thinking in 30 minutes. So I'm not sure how well that's going to work, but um, let me give it a try. So I think this idea of computation is probably the single most important intellectual achievement of the past century. And it's something that's really defined a lot of what we do today. And I think it's going to be even more important in the future. So what I'm going to talk about is kind of how one interacts with computation and how one thinks about it. So let me um, let me uh, start off by actually showing something here. Um, so let's imagine you walk up to your computer and the question is, does your computer have kind of computational intelligence built into it? Back when computers were first out and about, you didn't really expect much from your computer. It was just raw machine code. Then there were early languages and operating systems, networking and so on. Uh, what we can expect today is to have computational intelligence built into our computers. And I've been working on this for, for many years now, and millions of people use the things we've produced. But let me, let me kind of show you what, what do I mean by that? I don't know. Let's say I say, you know, prime of a thousand. What's the thousandth prime? Okay, we know that. Let's say we want to make a table of the first, uh, let's say we make a table of a thousand primes. Okay, we know how to do that. Let's say we want to make, um, I don't know, uh, let's make a plot that shows uh, shows those prime numbers. That's not terribly exciting. Let's say we want to make, uh, we want to work out differences between those prime numbers. Kind of the idea is we should be able to just walk up to our computer and have it know the things it needs to know so that we can take questions that we want to ask and immediately start to do computations with them. So for example, that was something with numbers. Let's say we want to do something with words. Let's say we, we should, should expect our computer to know uh, all the words in English. So there's a list of words in English. Let's say we want to just take, let's say we want to work something out about these words. Let's say we want to take the first letter of all those words in English. There we got the result. And now let's say we want to make a word cloud that shows us what's the most common letter. What are the, what are the frequencies of different letters here? So these are kinds of things. Okay, let's do that. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, let's do that for Spanish just for fun. Um, you know, who knows the answer to this already? It's like what what uh, pages of a Spanish dictionary will be the most uh, will be the most used? Okay, it looks like C and followed by A are the are the most popular words. Or we could say let's let's take um, let's pick up let's take an image or something. Uh, and let's say we take an image there. We could say let's uh, let's let's um, edge detect that image, or let's say um, uh, we can expect to just compute things based on what we have here. So actually, let, let's do something different. Let's say we want to blur that image, and let's say we want to let's do the following. Let's say nest list. Uh, so we're going to make a nested sequence sequence of images where we're progressively blurring more and more. So let's make 10 successively blurred images. Okay, so we're losing the tiger here. Let's say we want to, let's, let's just see what happens if we try and image identify what's in these pictures, see how far it can get, and still know it's a tiger. Um, so let's see, the percent just means the most recent thing we got. Let's see what, what it can do with this. Oh boy, it did really well there. Wow, I'm impressed. It must, uh, tigers, tigers are not as well camouflaged as we think. Let's go to 20 steps here. Let's see what it does then. Um, I think it's going to lose it eventually. It's going to say it's something crazy and different. Oh boy, the tiger is very obvious there apparently. Okay, well in any case, so so kind of the notion is we should just be able to uh, immediately know things about uh, about things in the world. So let's say we make um, so we make a graph. This might be a graph showing um, uh, relationships between people or something. We can just pick up that graph and we say um, let's uh, make a um, uh, a uh, plot of uh, communities in that graph. Or we could say we want to know something about um, about the world. Let's say we say Madrid, for example, here. Okay, we know that that's a city. And we could, for example, say, what's the population of Madrid? Um, we could say that's uh, okay. So let's say we want to know what's the, um, can we work out what the population has been over the course of time? Let's see how much data we have about that. Um, okay, so that only 34 data points, but let's say we can say, let's make a um, uh, let's make a plot that shows uh, the population of Madrid as a function of time. Okay, there it is. Or for example, we could say we're asking how far is it from where I am to where you are. I think you guys are are in Madrid. Let's let's um, let's see what the geo distance between Madrid and um, uh, and where I am. 
let's see, I'm actually in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, and the geodistance is 3,400 miles. Let's see, I should convert that um, into kilometers. Uh, and um, uh, there it is, 5,500 kilometers. So let, let's say, let's just do one more computation here. Let's say, let's get the capital cities in Europe, for example. Um, and let's, uh, let's get, then, then this is something where we're using natural language to specify what we want, but then what we're getting is this kind of symbolic representation, in this case, of, uh, um, of, of cities. And we could say, for example, let's find, um, let's say, find the shortest tour between those cities. Let's see if we can do that. Um, okay, so now that tells us that there's a, uh, so we could, we could, for example, make a picture which says, let's take what we've got there. Um, I should have put this all together in one, one line, but let me, let me not do that. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a, a plot that shows, I uh, hope, yeah, there we go. There's a, there's a kind of shortest tour that visits all the capital cities in Europe. Okay, so this is a little bit of a, an example of kind of what, what I mean by, by sort of computational intelligence. You can kind of just walk up to your computer and have it do these kinds of things, have it already know lots of things about the world and already be able to compute lots of things uh, for, from what it knows. And, and by the way, for, at a practical level, you, can, you could always say, if I wanted to, I could say cloud deploy something here and uh, make this into an API that I can, um, let, let's say, for example, let, let's do this, let's just for fun, let's just uh, let's do something very practical here. Let's cloud deploy an API function that takes, uh, um, let's say, takes the, uh, a city, um, and uh, something which is going to be a city, um, and um, then let's say we want to compute this thing. Um, let's see, hash city here, and then we want to say let's um, uh, actually let me go ahead. I can do the following. Let me just say I'm going to make that something that shows up on the web like that. Actually, let me just go ahead and publish this, and then everybody can use it. Um, let's say cloud publish uh, this API, and now hopefully, let's see what happens here. Um, okay, now we get this this object in the cloud. We can go there, and um, oh, I should have said, whoops. Let me actually do something different. Let me let me make a form, not an API. This is an API that will be called by an external program. This is a form intended for humans to use. So now I can go and. Um, uh, um, and get, oh, and I made a mistake here. Um, I should have said, I can change my code here. I should have said that, we go there. Okay, so now I've got a page on the web, if I could only get this to move to the right screen here. Hold on. Uh, ba, 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 ba. There we go. Okay, so now I've got a page on the web, and now I could say City Boston, and now it'll go and do the computation and give me a result there. So this is something I, I just created this this thing, and I deployed it here. And in fact, if you wanted to, you could take um, let's see, uh, let, let's just get the URL out of that, and let's say, oops, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, let's just get the URL from this, and then I could say something like uh, um, a barcode image of that um, as a QR code. And now, hopefully, if you go and point your phone at that, um, you can um, uh, you can get to that particular API that I just created. Um, I could also actually take this notebook that I've been creating here. Um, th this kind of the, the concept here is this is sort of I can make kind of a computational essay here. So I can go and say something like um, uh, cities in Europe or something here, and I can take this and write out what I'm doing, and then write it in, in uh, language, English, Spanish, whatever, um, and then also, also represent what I'm doing computationally. Okay, so this is a little bit of a kind of what I mean by sort of computational intelligence and computational language. Let me now talk a little bit more about the, the kind of the underpinnings of this, what, what, um, how to think about what we're seeing here. So in a sense, we can start with thinking about sort of what is computation? What is, what is going on when we do computation? Computation is about following rules, setting up rules that define how something should work and then following those rules. So a long time ago, I got interested in seeing how general is this notion of computation? To what, 
where can we apply this notion? And so one big place that I got interested in is applying it to the natural world, to understanding natural processes. Can we think about natural processes as computations? If so, what kinds of programs might nature be running? Well, the kinds of programs we're used to writing are these big complicated things that we carefully construct for our particular purposes. But if we just look at sort of programs at random, what might they actually do? So a type of program that I looked at a lot are things called cellular automata. Let me show you an example of one. Um, so here, the idea is, um, this is a, a very simple rule that just says you've got a line of black and white cells, and at each step, you update the color of each cell according to this rule, depending on the neighbors of that cell. So let's take a look here um, at what this particular rule does. Okay, let's, uh, let's start it off from just one black cell at the top and let's, um, let's run it for 40 steps, and let's just put a mesh so we can see the cells. Um, oops, and if I do this right, there we go. Oops, uh, what did I do here? Um, let's see, what did I do here? Um, oh, that's a big mistake. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is just starting off with this very simple rule. We start off with one black cell here. We get just very simple things to happen. Okay, so long ago, I got interested in, well, what happens when we use other kinds of rules? And we can just sort of imagine kind of looking at this computational universe of possible rules, kind of turning our computational telescope at that universe of possible rules and just seeing what's out there. So let me, let me do that computer experiment for you again here. So let's say I just look at, um, uh, lots of different, let's say I look at the first, um, let's do this, let's look at uh, the first um, um, 64 rules of this type. Okay, oops. Okay, so this is now experiment I first did back in the 1980s, and uh, looking at what happens with different kinds of possible programs, possible rules. So what we see is sometimes the behavior is really simple. We just get one black dot in the middle. Sometimes we get this more complicated kind of nested pattern here. Um, and, uh, but if we keep going, the most surprising thing I've, I've ever discovered is what happens when we get to this rule 30 here. So let's take a look at what rule 30 is. So let's just, uh, let's just copy these down here. Um, rule 30 is just another one of these simple cellular automaton rules. This is the rule, and um, let's see what it does. So it seems to be doing something kind of complicated. Let's keep going a little bit longer. Let's see if it sort of resolves to something simple. Let's run it, let's say, for 400 steps. Um, and uh, um, this is what it does. So this is really a remarkable thing, because we're just starting off with that very simple rule. We just start off with that simple black dot. And we're generating all of this complicated behavior. There's a certain amount of regularity over on the left, but many aspects of this pattern look for all practical purposes completely random. And uh, so this is sort of a fundamental thing that in the computational universe, it's very easy to make very complicated things. We're used to in doing engineering that if we want to make something complicated, we have to go to lots of effort, we have to set up very complicated plans and so on, but that's not what happens in the computational universe. In the computational universe, you just look out there with a sort of computational telescope and you immediately start finding all of this amazingly complex behavior. So how does this relate to, for example, what we know about nature? Well, nature shows us a lot of kinds of complexity and what seems to be the case is that the kind of secret that it's using to produce all that complexity is it's just running programs from the computational universe. Why haven't we seen more of these programs in, in what we do in technology? Well, it's because in doing technology, we want to be able to foresee what the, pro the programs that we set up are going to do. So we don't want something, we haven't wanted something whose behavior is as complicated as this. We want something where we can readily say, okay, this is going to behave in some, some straightforward way that we can readily understand something like this, for instance, instead. But uh, what we learn is that out in the computational universe, there is sort of amazing richness in what's possible. And uh, in a sense, we already knew a phenomenon like this. We knew that, for example, if you take, let's say, pi, there's a simple procedure for generating the digits of pi, but once they're generated, they seem for all practical purposes random. And that's the same kind of thing that we're seeing happen here. Okay, so what's the significance of this? Well, there are, there are many things that this implies. 
Uh, this provides kind of a new set of raw materials for making models of the, of the world, both social world and natural world. In the last probably 15 or 20 years, there's been really a transition from what was happening for the last 300 years, which is if you want to make a model of the world, you use a mathematical equation, to if you want to make a model of the world, you use a program. Um, and uh, that's been sort of a, a, a silent transition in the world of science that's happened in the last 15 or 20 years to this kind of computational paradigm. But there also are implications. For example, we can ask questions like, how difficult will it be to foresee what's going to happen in this system? How difficult will it be to foresee what's going to happen in some system that we model in the world? Well, one of the things that we discover is this phenomenon I call computational irreducibility, that uh, it's really not possible to work out what's going to happen in a system like this much more efficiently than just by running the system and seeing what happens. There's no a way that we can figure out. There's no way we can sort of succeed in being smarter than the system and figuring out what it's going to do more efficiently than just by running it. And that's something very different from what we've been used to in science. But it's something that we increasingly have to understand the implications of for science and many other things is this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. So one of the questions that comes up from realizing that such simple rules can produce such complicated behavior and that it relates to nature is what does this mean for kind of our whole universe and for physics and so on. So long ago, I, I, long ago I used to be a physicist, and, uh, but um, I, uh, there, there's sort of been a long-term question, just how simple can the underlying rules for the universe actually be? And a big surprise in the last year has been the fact that we've discovered that there is actually a way to understand how the universe works um, in terms of very simple rules. And I'll just sketch this. I'm not going to go into it in much detail. Um, this, is, uh, this is kind of a visual summary of, what, of what's going on there. Um, the, the idea in a cellular automaton, you've got this kind of line of cells and it's sort of predefined what space and time are like. What we think is going on in, in, actual, in the actual universe is that there's sort of an, uh, an infrastructure underneath space. It's just like we think of space as just this continuous thing where we can put a point anywhere we want. Just like we might think of a fluid like water as being a continuous thing where we can pick any place in the water we want. But actually we know for water that it consists of discrete molecules bouncing around. It's just it appears continuous on the scale we look at it. Well, we think the same thing is true of space and that actually space is composed of sort of individual discrete points, kind of atoms of space. And the only thing that's true about those kind of atoms of space is that they are sort of abstract elements with a certain identity and they have certain connectivity to each other. And so in general, we form this, this hypergraph that represents the relationships between these sort of atoms of space. And the remarkable thing is that when you kind of grow this hypergraph, you can just like what we saw in the case of cellular automata, you can do something like um, you could, uh, let's see if I can find one. No, that's not the right one. That's more like the right one. Um, let's say we just grow this hypergraph. Um, do I have a good example here? Sorry. Um, um, the, uh, uh, oh, let's find a better example. Um, uh, that's a good example here. Um, this should be an example. Yeah, here we go. So this is, this is just starting off from a very simple graph and showing how by applying very simple rules, you eventually grow this much larger graph. Well, turns out the graphs you grow, here's an example of one, um, the graphs you grow on a large scale can behave like continuous space. And so that's kind of how we understand that space, like something like water, is made up of discrete points. Uh, we think that the actual scale of those discrete points is something vastly smaller than anything we've known so far. It's probably more like 10 to the minus 100 meters and so on. Well, turns out, so, so in this model, one can understand the, how space arises. Time is a rather different kind of thing from space. Time is sort of the inexorable progress of computation. But it turns out that as a result of a phenomenon called causal invariance, it turns out that uh, one still reproduces kind of the, the, the notions of space-time that we've come to, the, to, to think of in relativity theory and so on. Well, then the next surprising thing is that this notion of space, uh, at the, in the abstract, it's just a bunch of points connected together. We don't even know that it's formed into something that we can think of as three-dimensional or whatever else. But it turns out you can think of this as being uh, limiting to something like a... Uh, uh, a finite dimensional space, and then it turns out you can also have curvature in space, 
And then the first big surprise is that from this underlying very simple model that involves just these, these atoms of space and these hypergraphs being rewritten and so on, you can reproduce Einstein's equations, you can reproduce the, the, all the phenomena that we know about gravity, and you can reproduce things like black holes and so on. Um, that, that's sort of one branch. Another branch that's important is that uh, you can reproduce quantum mechanics. And in fact, from, from these models, we can now get a much clearer idea of how quantum computing works. We can actually compile existing kind of quantum computing methods into the underlying structure of these models. And we can kind of see to what extent it's possible to really get advantages from quantum computing and so on. But the main point here is that what we've discovered in the last uh, year or so, in the last, uh, last six months since we, we announced it, um, is that we're really on a track here it seems to actually find the fundamental theory of physics and to discover that our universe is in some fundamental sense computational. And that kind of motivates understanding more about just what is out there in the computational universe of possible programs. Okay, well, so now the question is, we've got this giant universe of possible programs. They do all kinds of different things. Now the issue is, is this useful to us? So what, what, what is technology about? Technology tends to be about the idea of taking uh, taking things that exist in the world, perhaps in the natural world, and harnessing them for some human purpose or another. And so, for example, we might find out that there's, you know, magnetic materials in the world, and then we realize that we can harness that for the human purpose of making magnets and so on. Um, or we might find that there are liquid crystals and harness that for the purpose of making displays and so on. So now the question is, in the computational universe, how can we harness the things we find for some useful human purpose? So, for example, in the case of this Rule 30's cellular automaton, we've used this for many years as a random number generator. It's really good at that. Um, but that's, that's a particular purpose that we've managed to harness this thing for. But now, out in the computational universe, there's just an amazing amount of sort of computational capability there. And now the, the key question for us is, how do we connect that sort of ocean of computational capability with the things that we humans actually want to do? And in a sense, I've, I've spent a large part of my life trying to build that bridge between what's possible in the computational universe, trying to understand what's possible in the computational universe, and on the other hand, trying to understand how we represent what we humans actually want to do. And that's where computational language comes in. The whole idea of this thing we call Wolfram language is to create that bridge between uh, what, is, what is possible in the computational universe and what... Um, uh, and what we humans want to think about. So, you know, like in, in a typical natural language, there might be some tens of thousands of, of words. In Wolfram language, there are about 6,000 sort of core things that you can think about doing in terms of geometry or sound or geography or finance or engineering or whatever else. Um, and the idea is to have this, this computational language that represents whatever we want to think about in computational terms so that we can make use of the power of the computational universe to be able to do the things we want to do. Now, in a sense, the objective is, is very different from what's been done in kind of the long history of programming languages. Programming languages are about taking what computers do and providing wrappers around what computers do so that we can build programs that uh, are potentially quite large programs that kind of ultimately just tell the computer step by step what to do. What we've been trying to do with our computational language is to build something where we can represent the way we think about things computationally. And by the way, we can then get at computers to help us do that thinking. So kind of the notion of Wolfram language is not only to make something that computers can understand, but also to make something that us humans can understand, to essentially provide a notation for thinking about things computationally. So, you know, we might go back here and, and just look at this and see, and see this kind of computational notation that tells us what to do. So the way I think about this uh, sort of in terms of uh, sort of the historical implications is the following. Back, if you go back 400 years, people were doing math of various kinds, but it was very hard to go very far with math because you ended up having to talk about math using words. And that was not a very streamlined or, or sort of portable way to do it. Then mathematical notation was invented, plus signs, times signs, things like that. And suddenly it was possible to use math in a mainstream way, and sort of mathematical thinking really took off. And one got algebra and calculus and all the various mathematical sciences. And in a sense, what we're trying to do with computational language now is to make this, this 
notation, this medium in which one can represent computational thinking, in which one can, can represent the things one wants to think about in computational terms. And this provides, and, and just as mathematical notation kind of enabled the mathematical sciences that brought us a large chunk of, of what modern science is today, so the idea of computational language is to enable kind of computational X for all X. I mean, I think that um, uh, the, um, uh, for, for every field one can imagine from sort of archeology span to zoology, there either is now a computational version of the field or there will be. And that's kind of the version of the field that is going to take over in the course of the 21st century. So, so kind of the idea is, this is a sort of full scale computational language that's trying to represent all these kinds of things in the world in such a way that we can make use of the sort of the, the, the computational knowledge that our civilization has developed, we can package that all up and make use of it in this computational language to be able to represent things in the world computationally and do the computations we want to do. So that's kind of the, the mission that we've been on. And what's really fun to see is, is that our computational language is, is used in lots of places. It, it powers Wolfram Alpha, for example, which powers the computational knowledge of things like Siri and Alexa and so on. It also is used in lots of kinds of corporate settings um, behind lots of kinds of systems in the world that uh, people might say are doing AI or, or machine learning or, but, or uh, just dealing with knowledge or, or dealing with, uh, with pure computation. But underneath is Wolfram language running. And what's really fun for me to see is that in a sense, this, the, the concept of a full-scale computational language is something that's been kind of a separate branch in development from what we've seen in, for example, programming languages and so on. But it has allowed lots of people, including me, to build things which I think we can talk of and think of as sort of artifacts from the future. They're things that we kind of imagine can be done computationally, but it has not been possible. It, people, it's been hard to conceptualize, how would you do that computationally? Well, the notion here is to provide this computational language, which lets people think about things computationally um, and, uh, and then be able to get the computer to help them actually do those things and build large systems based on that. This is obviously important also at an educational level for letting people do the thing which is sort of the paradigm of the 21st century, think computationally, um, to get to the point where you can think about things computationally without learning all of the sort of details of low level computer science and never getting to the kinds of things where you actually get to compute about interesting things in the world. Well, just to, there's, there's, there's vastly more to say about all this. I'll just mention one more thing that I think I said I would talk about, um, which has to do with, with um, how to think about um, the, 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 this sort of the role of computational language in the future of things outside of, uh, of sort of pure, the things we usually think of as computation. So one, one area is uh, things like computational law. If you want to write a contract today, you would write a contract in natural language, English, Spanish, whatever else. Um, but you try and write it in kind of a legalese to make it a bit more precise than standard natural language. But in fact, what computational language allows one to do is to start thinking about writing that contract not in a natural language, but in a computational language, which is possible to be autonomously executed and where there's a, a precise definition of what it means. And one of the more important computational contracts that uh, we have to write is the kind of the contract with the AIs, so to speak. It's kind of the, the ultimate AI ethics question. You know, what is it that we really want to tell the AIs we want them to do? If we want to say, be nice to humans. We have to kind of define that more precisely. And the way I think we define it is to write in computational language what we mean by what we're saying there. We need to take the things we imagine that we're thinking about and turn them into computational language, which is then executable um, and understandable at a computational level. So I should probably wrap up there. Um, and um, I think the, uh, the main, main thing I wanted to communicate um, was this, this notion of computational language, this idea of being able to represent things in the world computationally. The, the, you know, we built this very practical system that uh, has tried to collect um, as much sort of computational intelligence as possible so that, it's, so that one can expect to just sort of walk up to one's computer and immediately expect it to, to be able to apply computational intelligence to lots of kinds of things. And the fact that this is sort of connected, what, what makes that really powerful is that there's this kind of ocean of computational possibility that we've discovered from the basic science of computation. And by the way, we now know 
but we now have really good evidence that our whole universe is making use of that kind of idea of computation because that's how fundamental physics seems to work. Um, and so this this notion that um, so we're, we're kind of the, the, the idea is there's this sort of ocean of computational possibility and we're gradually getting to mine little pieces of it. And what computational language does is it goes from the things we want to think about to the kinds of things that it's possible to, to execute in this computational universe of possible computations. All right, I should stop there. I hope I left time for some questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Stephen. We have, uh, we have I don't know, three questions. We have three questions. So it's uh, uh, the first one. I think it will be easy for you. It's how do you foresee the combination of algebraic computing with the statistical numerical computations in machine learning algorithms? So how do you foresee this combination of algebraic computation and stat uh, statistical numeric computation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so I mean, what's what's interesting is if we take um, uh, something like uh, the, there are things that we do which are very precise, which are very well defined. There are things we do which are instead based on things like machine learning. The thing that I think is the most powerful is to combine them together. So, for example, let's say we're we're dealing with our tiger here, and I was really surprised that um, uh, that it was able to identify this. But let, let's say we want to say, uh, let's say. Um, uh, image identification network. There we go. Okay, so this is now going to uh, let's let's actually take a neural net here. Let's take the neural net that does the identification, and we can we'll we'll see that that's just a a, a function here that is a function in our language. So we, it looks like kind of a a symbolic kind of function, but if we wanted to, we could uh, take this network apart. We could see what was inside there. Everything that's in there is kind of defined in a kind of symbolic way, but, um, uh, but what we get is, is this thing that we can use machine learning on. So, so for example, here, let, let's say we want to take our tiger, and instead of looking at the complete uh, output, let's just look at five layers of the neural net and apply that to the tiger, see what we get. Um, we'll probably get the, the internal thoughts. Okay, we need to make that into an image. We'll get sort of the internal thoughts of the neural net as it was doing this analysis. And so what's interesting here is just sort of the way in which we can kind of smoothly combine these things which are in a sense precise computations with things that, that I did a feature space plot looking at how these different pieces of the thoughts of the neural net um, were arranged in feature space and so on. So I think the, the greatest power comes from making use of things like machine learning as components in this bigger picture of doing overall computation. I mean, one thing I might say is that uh, you can ask, well, why don't you just use um, natural language? Let's say plot a you know cosine curve in purple. I don't know if that's going to work. Um, you just say, why don't you just write code by by using um, uh, by by um, um, uh, by by just uh, giving natural language? And so what one finds happens is that when when the thing one's asking to do is fairly simple, it's just sort of one sentence that can work quite well. When one wants to build up this more elaborate story about what computation one wants to do, the idea of just sort of tell the computer what to do in words stops working. And that's where the power of computational language and having this sort of organized, well-designed, coherent symbolic language becomes important, where you get to put together all these different pieces. So I think that's that's kind of the story, that, that um, what uh, uh, sort of things like machine learning end up being powerful components in this bigger picture where you build up the sort of whole stack of computational capabilities in the, in the notion in the in the context of symbolic language we have another another question for the, for the audience is uh, if you could please uh, clarify what is the difference between computational language and make it additional language more high level okay. right so so the the big point is that um, uh, it's a language which already knows a lot of things about the world so I mean, in you know, if you if you imagine sort of a typical programming language, I don't know, I, I don't know too many programming languages, but we could start up here, we could uh, let's see, we could we could start up a Python cell here, and we could start typing something in Python. But you know, we don't expect that Python will know, let's say, I don't know, uh, who Vincent Van Gogh was. Uh, we don't expect that that um, 
Uh, we don't uh, we don't know. You know, we could say what were the notable artworks of Vincent Van Gogh. We don't expect that um, um, that it will know something like that. Uh, we don't expect that we could take. I don't know. We could take. Uh, let's take a random collection. Let's let's take a random um, uh, a random collection of five of these. We don't expect that. Um, uh, we don't expect to be able to do computations immediately with these. So let, let's say, for example, let's get, um, um, let's see if we've got images for these. We may or may not have images for these, but let's see. Okay, there we go. We don't expect that now we could take one of these images and make, um, I don't know, we could say, let's make a, um, uh, a chromaticity plot out of these. Um, let's make 3D chromaticity plots from each of these. We don't expect that these are things that our language will intrinsically know how to do. Now, what's the importance of having a language that intrinsically knows how to do these things? Well, it allows one very quickly and very effectively to do real computations relevant in the world. And the thing that has been kind of my, my activity for the last 40 years is maintaining kind of a coherent design of everything that's here. It's not something where you start off with a little language and you build all these libraries and you have to fit libraries together and you have one library and it's incompatible with some other library and there's a library that does this and a library that does that. The idea is to have a single coherent language where it's designed so that all these different things, whether we're dealing with machine learning or image processing or numerical computation or things about uh, artworks or whatever, where all of that fits together. That's kind of the idea of having a full-scale computational language, a representation of the world in computational terms. That's kind of the notion of it. And you can think of it as kind of the, the unique case where one sort of built a library that knows about the whole world, so to speak, and did that in a coherent way so all the pieces fit together. But, but another, uh, you know, you may notice that there are features of Wolfram language which are really rather different from what one's seen elsewhere. Uh, you know, for example, the fact that there is a notion of an object that uh, uh, a symbolic entity that represents a, a Van Gogh uh, painting. That's, that's something that is um, the, the kind of the whole notion of symbolic programming is something that uh, is fundamental to what, what's going on here. Um, in fact, the, the idea of symbolic computation and the idea of kind of, you know, you define a function, let's say I want to define a function, I don't know, I might define, um, let's say, I'll define a function with two like this that um, takes, uh, does, I don't know, what, what might we do here? We might do some function that, um, and let me not, uh, but, but, but basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm specifying what the, the way the language works is it's defining rules for what to do with patterns. And these patterns can represent both things that are traditional uh, kinds of things that one might see in a typical programming language, but they can also represent this whole spectrum of other kinds of things in the world, um, including, you know, artworks or wherever else. Another question. Final question, because there's, there's some related ones about the future, about how you foresee the, the, the future of artifacts, the, the, the future of uh, computational languages, uh, the main uh, trends you identify, how do you foresee the future? Well, I mean, the, the, the main thing, the main immediate thing is what do you expect your computer to be able to do? And, you know, we have gone through over the last 60 years from it's just a raw computer to it's got some low level language to it's got an operating system, it's got networking, it's got a user interface. What we expect to have in the future is it's got computational intelligence built into it. All of that computational knowledge that's been accumulated by our civilization, whether it's about you know, properties of planets or characteristics of movies or whatever else, to have all of that knowledge immediately accessible and immediately computable, that's, that's something that I expect. Now, what does that mean? That means that you get to build a lot of magic things. I mean, today, there are, uh, this is why I sort of talk about artifacts from the future, Today, you know, if you look at uh, sort of people winning hackathons or startups doing amazing things, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll find lots of them where at the, at the bottom of it is our Wolfram language system, uh, being able to sort of bring computational intelligence to bear on, um, uh, on kind of a particular, a, a particular uh, problem or, 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 or task. And um, I think the, the, the most significant thing is that you can expect to see uh, kind of a, a, a sort of a big jump in the level of computational ability that you can expect to build things out of. Now, what, what uh, it also is something that you can expect is 
a, a level of, of a sort of a new way of thinking about the world where you think about the world computationally, where, where when you sort of formulate a question where you wonder about something about your personal analytics tracking or something, you know, have I had more cups of coffee while whatever is happening or whatever, and you've got the data for it, um, being able to routinely uh, take that and using computational language, express what you want and, and get results. I think that the, the, the notion of kind of thinking about things in the world, thinking about the ways that one sets up uh, businesses and so on in these computational terms, this is very powerful. And in order to kind of fix those ideas, in order to have a way of thinking about those things coherently, we need some language to think in, and that's what computational language provides for us. Now, going forward, there are just so many kinds of things that, uh, uh, that uh, computational language is important for. I mean, one, one example I've been a little bit involved in is questions about um, uh, when, when one wants to define something like, uh, no, I'm sorry. Did we lose it? Uh, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, it, it's fine. Oh, you can I, continue. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the, um, no, I, I, was, I was just going to say that, that um, lots of kinds of things about sort of, uh, uh, you know, expressing our preferences for, for things is something we can expect to do. We might do that by just uh, telling somebody in words what our preferences are for, you know, what we should see in our news feed or some such other thing. But we can also express that in computational language and it becomes a medium just like when, when literacy for, for ordinary natural language became uh, decently common 500 years ago, there is a moment that will eventually happen when there's sort of literacy in computational language that becomes common and where people expect to be able to communicate things in computational language, just like at least some part of the world expects to communicate things in mathematical language today. But it's a much broader uh, thing to communicate in computational language. Another thing that one realizes as soon as one realizes that sort of everything is becoming computational is that these kind of principles about how computational things work become things that are important in everyday life. So for example, from 300 years ago with people like Galileo and Newton and so on, we got ideas about uh, the way basic physics works and ideas about things like energy and momentum and so on in mechanics. And now we'll often think about energy and momentum as metaphors for lots of kinds of things in the world. Well, similarly, with sort of computation as a foundation for our understanding of lots of things, including as it happens physics, there are kinds of concepts that come in, like computational irreducibility, um, that are notions that then we realize are important uh, generally in the world. And so, for example, computational irreducibility is something that we gradually need to understand more of. It's about, it's kind of computational irreducibility is kind of explaining the limitations of things like science. People have sort of imagined you have science, you can predict what's going to happen, you can predict how the pandemic is going to play out, you can predict this or that thing. It's uh, the thing that one realizes is that one, one, one has been, the particular ways that science has been used are making use of kind of the pockets of computational reducibility that people have found. But the fact is that a lot of what's out there in the kind of scientific world is computationally irreducible. That is, the only way you can work out what's going to happen is essentially to, to simulate it or play out what, what actually happens and, and, and see what happens. And it's this, this phenomenon. So this is something we kind of learn from the fact that sort of it's computation all the way down is we have to take seriously these kinds of concepts like computational irreducibility as things which are, uh, have an effect on, on all the kinds of things that we see in the world and, and the way that we think about things in, in sort of everyday life. And the question of sort of, uh, can we, uh, uh, to what extent can we expect that uh, we can just sort of rely on science to tell us what's going to happen? That, w that from within the, the sort of the foundations of science is this phenomenon of computational irreducibility that kind of describes the limitations of science. It both describes the, the, the existence of computational irreducibility, both tells one that computation really achieves something. It achieves some sort of irreducible amount of work but it also tells one that there are limitations on what one can say about what that computation will do. So those are a few of the few of the kind of indications of of, um, uh, of kind of the um, uh, where things will go. I mean, computational language is really the bridge between what is computationally possible and what we humans want to think about. And one of the things that's always interesting in the evolution of language is the way that that what one 
talks about in language, one then can think about and build on top of. So for example, there was a time before the word blog existed. And one might have said, well, I'm writing these pieces and I'm putting them on the web and so on and so on and so on. But then after there are enough of those kinds of things, the term blog gets invented and then one can start talking in terms of blogs and one can start thinking about sort of how one builds things up from that. And it's the same way with computational language. Once one has sort of uh, taken these concepts and made them into something that one has sort of organized in a coherent way in a computational language, one gets to start thinking in terms of those concepts. And I know over the last uh, 34 years that I've been building Wolfram Language, uh, what's happened is they're, they're a set of concepts and as we understand them better, we can see further and we can build more and more and, and sort of in, incorporate more and more into this kind of computational language to represent the world. But I think that that's, um, that's the thing that I can ex we can expect to see happen is as computational language gets better understood, uh, there are these concepts that come into existence that when, then one can reason in terms of and build other concepts on top of them. I mean, it's interesting to me over the past uh, uh, 30 years or so that there are ideas that I wanted to put into the early versions of Wolfram language, particularly to do with higher order functions and functional programming and things like that, which were hard to put in because there was not good ambient understanding of these things in the world at large. So you put them in there, but nobody understands how to use them, and that's not a, a worthwhile language. And over the course of time, as sort of the sort of one's been able to build these layers of understanding, it's possible to go further and further and to, to sort of make use of the kind of conceptual framework that's been built with computational language. So thanks a lot, Stefan. A real honor having you here to, to, to close this, this edition of Business Conference. So it's uh, thanks so much. Take care and uh, keep in touch. Bye. Bye-bye.